You are listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truth in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. If you haven't already, we'd have you take your Bibles, if you would please, and have them open at the 39th uh, Psalm. Uh, We'll be centering our thoughts on uh, this uh, particular passage tonight as we expand our thoughts that we uh, brought this morning. And I want to begin uh, by perhaps saying this, that in our society, the society in which we live, and we see it uh, so often, uh, even here in Penrith, we have dog pounds and catches to round up stray animals. You've all seen that take place. That conjures up a picture in my mind, and I've often wondered why we don't have catches and pounds for stray words. You know, the words that we let fly, which often leave people feeling like shredded wheat in their wake. And the truth of the matter is we need these catches so that they can get these words off the street. We hear words that belittle people all of the time and we need to have them off the street. But I want you to imagine just for a moment here tonight... uh, that you're at home, you're sitting at home in the comfort of your home, and that same word or those same word catches suddenly ring your doorbell. You answer the door and they say, excuse me, does this word belong to you? Uh, We caught it running loose, backbiting everybody at your work. And your boss said it, really sounded a lot like the words that you use. It sounded like the words you use. And that raises a question in my thinking here tonight uh, once again. Are you missing any strange words or any stray words, I should say, more correctly? Did you ever wish that you could take back something that you said? Something that you said in anger, something that you said harshly, something that you said too quickly without giving thought to it, something where in which you engage the mouth before you really engage the brain. Simon Peter did. Like that rebuke he loosed on Jesus for teaching that he would be rejected and killed and resurrected in Mark chapter 8. The sons of thunder, James and John, wished that they had kept a few of their rumblings to themselves as well, like the time when uh, a Samaritan village refused to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in to minister to them. And the overzealous brothers asked Jesus in Luke chapter 9, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Looking back, Peter, James and John regretted the junkyard words uh, that they sicked on others. And it just may be that when they felt remorse, they turned to a song to salve their consciences, a song like Psalm 39, written by a man called David when he too was feeling remorseful about some stray words perhaps that he had used. But Psalm 39 is more than just a song about remorse. I want to suggest to you here tonight that it's also a record of David's attempt to control his tongue. And before we get into this portion of the blessed word of God tonight, before we begin our study, let's familiarize ourselves with several features of this wonderful little psalm that has been penned by the pen of David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The superscription beneath the title of Psalm 39 would actually be verse 1 in a Hebrew Bible. And the superscription reads, For the director of music for Jedjathan, a Psalm of David. 
You see, written by David, it is also an inspired part of the Hebrew text. And this superscription appears in only two other Psalms in all of the Bible, Psalm 62 and Psalm 77. And in all three, this fellow by the name of Jeduthon is assigned, assigned the task of interpreting the song musically. Did a little bit of study on Jeduthon and... Uh, According to 1 Chronicles chapters 16 and 25, Jeduthun came from a line of musicians. He belonged to a musical family. He was an accomplished musician himself. And he had six sons who ministered as temple musicians in the, the temple of God. And so you can begin to see perhaps why David felt confident that Jeduthun could skillfully transpose the feeling of his words into music, that he could take the words that he had written and then transpose them into music. Now understand typically that the subject of a psalm is often revealed at the beginning. In this particular psalm, however, Psalm 39, the subject waits for us at the end. And I refer you to verses 12 and 13. Follow along in your copy of God's inerrant word. And here we read this. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. For I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Look away from me that I may rejoice again before I depart and am no more. When you read those words, obviously, you can draw the conclusion that David is distressed. There's an ache in his heart because something has come between him and his Lord. And we really don't know the, the details of David's sorrow, but from the constant references to his tongue and to his speech throughout the rest of the psalm, which we'll look at in a few moments' time, it appears that he may have said some things that he regretted deeply. And the style of the psalm seems to flow naturally out of four specific techniques that David tries in his quest to find a way to muzzle his tongue, to find a way to zip his lip. So let's follow David as he begins his search. The first approach would be, I will handle this alone. I can do it by myself. That has a ring to it, doesn't it? It has a ring to it because that's what all of us said to our parents as children. All of us said that as parents, as teenagers. I can do it by myself. And it also typifies David's first approach to controlling his tongue. I can do it by myself, Lord. I don't need any help from you, Lord. And I say that simply because 15 times David uses the words I and my in the first three verses of this psalm. I, 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 my. A passage full of puffing and panting of, of self-effort. Follow along, verse 1, 2, and 3. Look what it says. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. My heart grew hot, the scripture says, within me. And as I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Notice David's self-effort comes in two styles. In verse 1, the plan is simply to guard or watch what he says. And apparently that failed, however. So in verse 2, David decides just to stop talking altogether. And what was the result? Well, the scripture says his sorrow or his anguish grew worse. It increased. And then in verse 3, we find that David has become like a volcano about to erupt. 
The thoughts and feelings he has kept stuffed down inside has, has been burning and seething until he is ready to explode and fly off, as it were. Someone has said that there are three phases in the Christian life. First, there's this is the wonderful stage where everything seems easy. Then as we begin to grow a little, we enter into the boy, this is hard phase. Now everything seems difficult. And finally, once we have matured and got a little older in the faith and matured in the faith, our, our, in the faith, our philosophy becomes this is impossible. Sound contradictory? It is at least to the world's way of thinking. You see, church, the world prizes an I-can-do-it-by-myself attitude. While the mature Christian, the one who has been honed by the hand of the living God, learns to prize an attitude of dependence upon God, he learns to walk in dependence upon the living God. And I'm here to tell you tonight, apart because, you know, we're moving into December and we'll soon be in January, and apart from God's help, all of the New Year's resolutions that we make to muzzle our mouths are doomed to fail. Why? I'll tell you why, because I and me are at the root. Remember what James says in the passage that we looked at this morning in James chapter 3 in the 8th verse. No one can tame the tongue, remember? We can tame uh, lions and tigers, tigers and all of that, but we cannot tame the tongue. It took some time. But David, the sweet psalm singer of Israel, finally realized this about his first technique which then led him to his second approach, I cannot handle this alone. Once his first technique had utterly failed, David cried out in frustration to God, asking for some insight about himself. And we find that in the fourth verse. Follow along, it says, Show me, O Lord, my life's end. And the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. And I want you to understand that verse 4 is kind of a colloquialism from David's day, which in effect is saying, Lord, help me to see myself as you see me. You see, the Greeks were only partially right when they taught that the beginning of wisdom was to know thyself. But I'm here to tell you tonight that real wisdom is to see ourselves through the lens of God's divine perspective. And following his request, David then announces three things that God has shown him about himself. First, David learned that his life was brief. And you can see that in verse 5, the first part of that first five, verse 5. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. You see, in David's day, things uh, were measured by uh, the Cuban. And if you want to know... Uh, how long a cubit is, it's around about from the, the elbow to the tip, of the, the tip of the finger, and it's around about 18 to 20 inches. And if you wanted an even shorter measure, there was a handbreadth. Literally, the, the span from the tip of the thumb to the, to the tip of the little finger. And David realized that his days are short. You see, he just measured his life like that, just a little bit. A hand's breadth. And then next David recognizes that he is weak. Because verse 5 continues on, The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. 
Sila. That word Sila is a musical notation indicating a pause for emphasis or meditation. And what was he asking? Uh, what was he? What was the, the thought in, in meditation? Well, the thought is this: in the infinity of God's sight, the best that man's lifetime can be compared to is a brief puff of air, a mere breath that can't be held for long. If you have any doubt about that, you need to take a little trip 200 yards up the road to the cemetery when the lights, when, the, when it's daylight, and go along and look at all of the gravestones. You know, whether a person lives for 100 years, whether they live for 20 years, 30 years, or six months, their life is measured by a short dash between two dates. Just a brief breath. David's mind is pierced with how fragile and how uh, uh, weak human life is. And then finally God taught David that he was proud. In verse 6, look what it says. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. And that word phantom in the Hebrew literally means an image. And the idea is that of each of us is concerned with keeping up an image that, that others will applaud and amassing a fortune that, a fortune that others will inherit. But all of that anxiety and all of that attention is ultimately futile because life here on earth is so ephemeral. And summing it all up, God was showing David that he wasn't supposed to even try to handle it alone. The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle of Grace, records how he learned this same lesson in 2 Corinthians 12. So if you just hold your place in, uh, in Psalm 39 and very quickly go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's good to see the little puffs of dust coming up out of the pews because uh, you've, uh, you maybe haven't been flicking your Bibles uh, too much uh, in, uh, during the COVID period. But... Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, keeping your hand in Psalm 39, apparently the Apostle Paul was afflicted with something that he called his thorn in the flesh. You've heard us refer to that often, his thorn in the flesh. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9, we read these words. And the Apostle Paul, great Apostle of Grace, said this, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. That word perfect means reaches its ultimate. And the thought is that God's power reaches its ultimate in us when we admit our weaknesses and depend upon him. So how did Paul respond to this news? Look at it, verse 9. He says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, he says, I delight in weaknesses and in insults and in hardship and in persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Know thyself. Paul did as few saints do. Back to Psalm 39 and we'll look at the third approach. I don't want to handle this alone. At this point, David moves a step closer to God's plan for the believer. You can almost hear the 
exasperated sigh in his voice as he finally asks, what, Lord, do I do? Look at that, verses 7 and 8. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all of my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. You see, the destruction wrought by David's transgression weighs heavily on his conscience. He feels guilty, embarrassed, ready to try the one technique that God prescribes for the tongue. And that brings us to the fourth approach. Lord, you handle this for me. Listen to what happens when David leans on the Lord's strength instead of his own. Verse 9. I was silent. I would not open my mouth. For you are the one who has done this. What a tremendous breakthrough. You are the one who has done it. From an out of control rage to an obedient stillness, David finally discovers the control that he has been searching for. And who gets the credit? The Lord. David says, he's the one who made it possible. You are the one who has done this. And the sweetness of David's victory over the tongue is tinged, however, with the pain of God's ongoing chastening. So he asks that this scourge, meaning God's reproofs, be removed. Look at that, verses 10 and 11. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. You rebu rebuke and discipline me for their sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. Selah. Think about that. And then we come to a concluding prayer. You see, like all of us, David wishes that he could take back some of the things that he had said during his life. There's not a single solitary person who sits in this church tonight who wishes he could not take back words that he had said. This psalm, however, was not one of them because David wants God to hear these words. So he prays. Look at that. Verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping, for I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Look away from me, that I may rejoice again before I depart and am no more. My friends, are you exhausted from trying to tame a tongue that simply refuses to be bridled? Alone, none of us can do it. But with the Lord, there's hope of strength and a second wind. You know that wonderful verse of Scripture in Isaiah 40, 31 that says, those who hope... In the Lord are those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. There's a beautiful analogy in there because the Hebrew word for hope and wait means to twist or stretch. It's the idea of twisting threads around one another to make a great rope that won't break. And Isaiah is saying that those who twist their weaknesses around the strength of the Lord will gain a new strength. And with this new strength, it will keep or help you to keep a leash on your tongue. 
Psalm 39 reflects that David knew how to muzzle his mouth. He struggled. But he finally learned the importance of timing and the value of a word spoken in right circumstances. And church, with the Lord's help, through the effectual working power of the Spirit of God, so can we. Know when to speak, not to speak. And in so doing, we will bring praise and honour and glory to the Lord as we muzzle our tongue. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, tonight we want to thank you for the joy, the privilege of being part of your forever family. To be able to draw aside yet still in this freedom of this country and to be instructed from your word. And we have seen, Father, from the teaching of James this morning and through the Psalm of David tonight that it's so, so important for us to be able to control our tongues. Because, Father, tongues are the words that are spoken can tear people down rather than build them up. And we know, Father, that we as Christians should always, in our relationships with others, be endeavouring to build them up. We pray as we leave this place tonight that you will get the praise and the honour and the glory. For we ask it in the precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for tuning in with Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org. Until next time, God bless.